This is part two for chapter 14, Disease and Epidemiology. In part one, I discuss vocabulary for the chapter, your normal flora, how it's acquired, and your relationship with normal flora, and also Cook's postulates. In this part of the chapter, I'm going to go over classifying diseases. So there are several sets of terms that we use to classify the different diseases. For this, you may want to look at your list of microbes to memorize because I will go through some of the diseases and through their classification. And also on your exam, you will have to classify some common diseases. The first two terms we're going to use to describe a disease are signs and symptoms. And these two terms describe the evidence of disease. Now in regular conversation, signs and symptoms are used almost interchangeably. Actually, we probably only use the term symptoms, but there are important differences between these two terms. Signs. Signs are objective measures of disease. So signs are something that the healthcare provider can observe and measure. So to observe signs of disease, you do not need any input from the patient. Symptoms are experiences, feelings that the patient has. So these are subjective. So these are things that the healthcare provider cannot directly observe and the patient has to tell you that they are experiencing symptoms. This is a table that gives you a common list of some signs and symptoms and keep in mind that signs can be measured by the healthcare provider. So some of these you are very familiar with, fever, uh, you use the thermometer to measure that, septicemia, uh, that's the number of microbes multiplying in the blood, microbes in tissues and fluids, chest sounds, skin eruptions, leukocytosis, leukopenia. This is a measure of the number of white blood cells. Leuco means white. Then swollen lymph nodes, you can palpitate those, abscesses, tachycardia, increased heart rate, and antibodies in the serum. So all of these an individual, a healthcare provider can observe. Symptoms on the other hand, symptoms are things the patient has to tell you they are experiencing. So things like chills, pain, nausea, malaise, chest tightness, itching, headache, weakness, abdominal cramps, anorexia, loss of appetite, and sore throat. As a review, a thermometer is used to measure temperature, and this can be done without the patient's input by a healthcare provider. So on a patient who cannot speak, like a baby or a patient in a coma, so this is a sign of disease. This scale is used to measure pain, and because we say we're measuring the pain, sometimes you may think that that is a sign, but who is measuring the pain? It's the patient who is telling you the level of their pain. You cannot look at a patient and determine if their pain is a five or a six. So the patient has to tell you. So it is a subjective sign of disease. The next set of terms that I wanna discuss are how diseases behave in a population basically how it's transmitted through a group of people. And there are three terms with this, non-communicable, communicable, and contagious. So the first term, non-communicable. A non-communicable disease is not transmitted from person to person. So one way to think of this, these types of diseases is that if you are treating a person with a non-communicable disease, you do not have to worry about acquiring the disease from that person. Now, infectious non-communicable diseases usually are caused by microbes either from that person's own flora or from the environment. Some examples of non-communicable diseases could be a systemic mycosis, 
Systemic mycosis is when a person inhales dirt that has been kicked up into the air and the fungus that is found in the dirt causes a disease, fungal disease in their lungs, which spreads out to the rest of their body. Another non-communicable disease could be tetanus. Tetanus is where an individual steps on the rusty nail and the Clostridium tetani is injected into the bottom of their foot and they develop tetanus. Other infections could be like staph infections. So all of these are non-communicable because they come from environmental bacteria or from the person's own flora. The second term is communicable. A communicable disease is transmitted from person to person. So again, a way you can think about this is if you are treating a person with a communicable infectious disease, there is a possibility that you could acquire the disease from this person. And a lot of diseases are communicable. Probably a lot of the diseases on the microbes to memorize list are communicable. Third term is contagious. So a contagious disease is really a type of communicable disease. So a contagious disease is transmitted from person to person, but it's very, very easily transmitted from person to person. So something, a contagious disease is something that you are very likely to acquire from another person. And one of the measures for how diseases are transmitted is the R0 or R0. R0 is the basic reproduction number of a disease, and this indicates how many people will be infected from one person who has an infection. And you've probably been hearing a lot about this with the coronavirus. This is a list of some diseases and their R0 values. And here it lists the disease, lists the disease, and then the transmission type, which is important, and then the R0 number. So for measles, measles is airborne. So a person who is infected with measles is exhaling the virus. And that person, one infected person, is able to infect between 12 and 18 other people. So this is definitely considered contagious, probably the most contagious disease. Smallpox, which we don't have anymore, was also airborne. And smallpox, one individual would infect five to seven other individuals. Uh, influenza, the 1918 pandemic, uh, that infected two to three people. So one person would infect two to three people. Ebola, Ebola, that's bodily fluids, so that's different than airborne, and that was 1.5 to 2.5 people. And the common thing we have now with coronavirus, I found this uh, table with coronavirus. So coronavirus is down here, and technically COVID-19, because there are, are other corona, coronavirus diseases, but right now it seems as if the R R naught is 1.4 to 2.5, which is very similar to seasonal flu, which is between one to two. The next set of terms are the frequency of occurrence. So this is how common the disease is in uh, a population. And for this, there are four terms, endemic, sporadic, epidemic, and pandemic. So endemic, endemic occurrence. This means that the disease is constantly present in the population. So no matter when you look at the population, what time of year, there are always a small number of people expressing the disease. Uh, the common cold is endemic in Rockford. So no matter what time of year, you will find people who are expressing the disease, the common cold. Uh, Enterobias vermicularis, if you remember, that is pinworm. I told you in Rockford that there are children, I would guarantee that there are children who have pinworm. So that is considered endemic. So endemic, it means it is constantly present in your defined population at low levels. 
second term is sporadic. So sporadic, this is where you get a increase in the number of individuals who are expressing the disease. So sporadic, kind of like a small outbreak. And this is where the numbers are higher than the endemic numbers, if there are endemic numbers. Measles is a common one that we're having sporadic occurrences with as people have reduced the level of vaccination. So measles, normally, we do not have endemic levels, so the level should be zero, but every so often there are some outbreaks of measles, and that's considered a sporadic occurrence. Uh, in the Rockford area, we have had whooping cough outbreaks. So we haven't had measles yet, but we have had whooping cough. Third term is epidemic. Epidemic means that a lot of people are affected over a short time. So often what we worry about is that a sporadic occurrence will develop into an epidemic. So if you don't control the sporadic outbreak, it can lead to many people being affected over a short period of time. And with measles having a really high r not factor, that's a real danger. The last term is pandemic. So pandemic, that is basically an epidemic all over the world. So pan refers to the world. So pandemic uh, is where the disease is affecting a lot of people all over the world. Now, one of the things that's important with defining the frequency of occurrence is defining your population. So if you look at the world population, AIDS is considered a pandemic because there are high cases in Africa and high cases in Asia, high number of cases. But if you look just at the population of the United States in terms of AIDS, it has become endemic. So constantly present at a relatively level uh, frequency. So it's very, very important to define your population in order to determine frequency of a disease. The next set of terms relate to the severity of the disease. So the severity of the disease deals with the duration, how long it lasts, and the level of signs and symptoms. How severe, how strong are the signs and symptoms? And for this, there are three terms, acute, chronic, and latent. So acute, an acute disease occurs over a very short time. So that could be days to weeks. And the level of signs and symptoms is very strong. So you're going to have a very high fever, a lot of pain, a lot of nausea. So that's an acute disease. Uh, Acute diseases that we are familiar with, the common cold is acute. It only lasts about two weeks on average. The flu is acute. Uh, COVID-19 is acute. Ebola is acute. So now acute is just telling you the duration and the level of signs and symptoms. It does not indicate whether it is deadly or not because the common cold is obviously not deadly. Ebola is extremely deadly. So that's acute. Second term, chronic. Chronic happens over a long period of time, so months to years, and the signs and symptoms are relatively low or mild. So for a chronic disease, you're going to have it for a very long time, but it's going to be a low grade fever or a low amount of pain. Hepatitis is a chronic infectious disease. The last term, latent. Latent this is a type of disease where the microbe is inactive for a period of time. So for a period of time, you're going to have absolutely no signs and symptoms. And some latent diseases, uh, HIV, AIDS. AIDS technically is the disease that is a latent disease. So the person can have a period of years, even decades, where they have no signs or symptoms and then they can develop some signs and symptoms. Uh, chicken pox and shingles. Chicken pox is a herpes virus. 
that produces a latent disease. You have chicken pox when you're younger. The virus has spliced into your chromosome, so it remains latent. And then if there's a trigger it, later on, you can develop shingles. Actually, all herpes viruses are this way. Herpes simplex 1, cold sores. Herpes simplex 2, the STD. Both of those are latent. You can have a period of time with no signs and symptoms, and then you can express those uh, for a brief period of time. The last set of terms that I wanna go over are host involvement. So this is where the disease is affecting the host. And for this, the terms are local, systemic, and focal. So localized infection, this is where the microbe and the signs and symptoms are localized to one area. So one area of the body, usually where the microbe entered. So in an example of this would be a staph infection. So the staphylococcus from the uh, staphylococcus epidermidis from the skin enters into a break in the skin and causes a localized infection. Common cold is a localized infection. Common cold enters the respiratory system and the disease process it remains localized to the upper respiratory system. So that's a localized infection. The next type of infection is a systemic infection. Systemic infection, this is where the microbe uh, travels throughout the body and so you get the signs and symptoms throughout the body. Measles is a uh, systemic infection. It enters the respiratory system and then it has an effect all over the body. For systemic infections, there are some other terms such as toxemia, viremia, bacteremia, and septicemia. So for these terms, the emia refers to the blood and it refers to what is in the blood. So for toxemia, toxins are in the blood and traveling to different parts of the body causing uh, uh, signs and symptoms. For viremia, what would be in the blood? Viruses are in the blood. Bacteremia, this is where bacteria are in the blood. And septicemia is a special term. Septicemia refers to when bacteria are in the blood, but they're not just in the blood, they're actively replicating. So bacteremia is where bacteria are just found in the blood. Septicemia is where the bacteria in the blood are actively replicating. And this is a very deadly situation. So localized infections, systemic infections, and then the last type of infection is a focal infection. So a focal infection is where the infection starts in one place and travels to a specific second location. And the best example of this is caused by streptococcus pyogenes. Streptococcus pyogenes is on your microbes to memorize list. It causes strep throat, of course, and scarlet fever. So what streptococcus pyogenes can initially do is you inhale it, it causes an infection in the throat, strep throat, and then if it is untreated, what it can do is it can move to the heart and have an effect on the valves in the heart. So that is a focal infection. It starts off in the throat and then over a period of time, it moves specifically to a second location, focal infection. The last type of infection that I wanna talk about are primary infections and secondary infections. A primary infection is the first microbe that infects the body and causes a disease. Then due to the damage done by that primary infection, that allows a second microbe to come in and cause damage to the host. So an example of this could be chickenpox. So chickenpox is a virus that causes a systemic infection and it damages the skin by forming these pock marks. 
So that is part of the signs of the disease, the lesions on the skin that a healthcare provider can observe and count. And this causes damage to the skin. And often these pockmarks are itchy. So what would happen is the patient would itch the skin and staph would move into the skin, causing a secondary infection, which is the staph infection. So that's a primary infection and a secondary infection.